I'm David Ainsworth, Head of Communications at the United Nations Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity. We're at the Geneva meetings and we're talking about plant genetic resources in our Biodiversity Beat interview. We have with us Kent Nadozi, who's the Executive Secretary of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. Kent, welcome. Thank you very much, David. So can you tell our viewers a little bit about the treaty? Talk about the goals and what you're doing with the treaty. Yeah, thanks so much, David. Uh, the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture was negotiated as um, uh, a response to the needs and peculiarities and specificities of the agriculture sector. The objectives mirror that of the Convention, but with specific focus on food security and sustainable agriculture. So it is, uh, encompasses a whole range of the objectives the conservation, sustainable use, and uh, fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from the utilization of gen plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. And it creates a multilateral system that recognizes the dynamics of exchange and utilization of crop genetic diversity in the agriculture sector. The international treaty has positively impacted the lives of almost one million people like Mufaro, helping conserve the world's crop diversity and contributing to future food security. How many parties do you have for the treaty now? Currently we have 148 parties, including the European Union. And we're hoping to make it a universal agreement and growing faster and want to paint the world green, uh, as we say. Great. So you're here at the Geneva meetings. So what is the treaty and its parties looking for in this post-2020 global biodiversity framework? Uh, the main thing we're looking for is that because it deals specifically with biodiversity, it's an international agreement on biodiversity, but focus on agricultural sector, that is important for the global biodiversity framework to be truly global and truly universal, it must incorporate and involve all the biodiversity related conventions, including the International Treaty. We're looking that we'll make a contribution to it, we'll, you know, have um, the objectives and the mandate of the treaty um, incorporated and recognized within that framework so that the countries um, and parties as well can take advantage of the experiences, the indicators, and the processes that are ongoing in, that, uh, in, the, in, the, in the treaty, in the framework when it's finally adopted. Um, so indeed, the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework is indeed meant to encompass and, and incorporate the work of all of the biodiversity-related conventions. So that's, uh, that's great to see. Now, the other thing that we're expected to uh, address in the framework and beyond is to develop language that will address the question of digital sequence information. Indeed, in the plenary uh, today, which is Monday the 21st of March, we had three hours of discussion on that. So how would such language in this framework affect the work of the treaty? Indeed, it is um, as significant for the treaty as it is currently with the convention, because it is one of the issues that are still unresolved within the treaty community. Because of course, being genetic diverse, genetic resources, issues of digital sequence information is also key there. And that is something that's been discussed. So our hope is that whatever decision or agreement that will be reached here would also assist in resolving the issues that we're also dealing with in the uh, under the treaty. It yeah. could provide, I mean, even though there are specificities for the agriculture sector, but it could also provide a pathway to resolving the, uh, the issues within our own uh, treaty. Okay. So speaking of pathways, we're going to finish this meeting and you've got your own meeting, I think, coming up. What's, what are the next steps for the plant treaty? Yeah, we're going to have our own, um, the governing body session, which is also the equivalent of COP in September in India. And one of the issues that will be discussed is whether or not and how to uh, restart the negotiations for the enhancement of the treaty's multilateral system, uh, which was it, it, um, the uh, they could not reach agreement at the last session because of one of the issues of the of dispute was of course the DSI. Yeah, so the next step is that session of the governing body, which will deal with all the usual issues on the agenda. But this one in particular is one that uh, could also be um, taken up there. So it's kind of important then, I guess, that under the CBD we have some sort of movement forward <laughs> on the Indeed, digital yes, information. Indeed, it will certainly be helpful. That, uh, at least it will also help create the atmosphere that would facilitate and help. Uh, because in, indeed, there were uh, parties who, you know, who had suggested that we should wait until the process in the CBD you know, so order is settled so that they can come back there. But so, as I said before, the specificity of the agriculture sector, of course, is, um, is a bit different. But then um, if it's resolved there, certainly will help. Uh, creating you know the platform that we can use as a basis for to move forward. 
Great, excellent. Well, Kent is certainly going to be following and other actors following these discussions in DSI. Uh, and so we'll also be looking forward to seeing how your procedure yes, moves absolutely. forward as well. Indeed. Great. I look forward to it as well. Good. Well, thanks for joining us today, Kent, and uh, we'll give you a chance to get back to the negotiations uh, here and, and monitor and pay attention. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. It was a great pleasure. David. Great. Thank yeah. you. Okay. So tune in for our next Biodiversity Beat interview. I'm David Ainsley.